This episode of The Curbsiders is sponsored by ACP's Internal Medicine Meeting 2019. This is the premier live clinical and practice-related education meeting for internists and subspecialists. It's taking place from April 11th to 13th, 2019 at the Pennsylvania Convention Center here in my hometown of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I can tell you that I am super excited for this meeting. I was there last year and I will be there this year with my Curbsiders co-hosts and I can't wait to get back together with all our internist friends from around the country. We really hope to see you there. The Curbsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only. And the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more of the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity aside from possibly cash back more hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much we are responsible if you're wrong. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're right. Hey guys, welcome back to the Curbsiders. Hi Matt, how was your new year? Wait, this is gonna like go. Wait, when is this? No, it's, it's the new year. It's currently February. This will air or... in the new year. No, this will air at the end of January, so it's the new oh. year. It's pretty close. Yeah. Cool. It's good. How's your January? How'd it go? It's good. My my children were very sick. I was legit worried. They're better now. Uh, I got sick, but it was very quick, and now I'm better too. My my son actually had Campylobacter. Did you know about that one? Yeah, that was scary. Yeah. So he's better now too. Yeah, yeah. He he's actually he's back home and family's doing great. Thank you for asking. Hey Paul, how you doing? I'm great. How are your mediocre sons? Mediocre sons are fine. Yeah, that's the the whole family's healthy. Um <laughs> so grateful for that and glad that uh, your kids are doing okay. So before I set up this uh hyperkalemia episode, Paul, can you can you do that thing where you scold the audience? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, and I should probably also remind us that we are the Internal Medicine Podcast, and we use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice-changing knowledge. And then this is the part where I tell you that we do get to know the guest a little bit up front at the beginning of the show and talk about things that we do to, to decompress and things that make us better-rounded people, the type of better-rounded person you would be if you actually listened to the intro. You do have the option to skip past it, but just know that you'll be... I don't know. I, I don't like the phrase less of a person. I'm just I'm having a hard time coming up with an alternate. <laughs> but you can refer to the show notes if you need to for the timestamps to skip past that stuff. Hmm. Do you practice those soliloquies? Nope. It's you're you're speaking off the cuff is like how, how many yeah. times have you been to Dale Carnegie? I just have to imagine <laughs> <laughs> Toastmasters, Paul. Sure. Yeah. His, <laughs> don't, Stuart, don't his movie reviews and it, it, it sounds like he's been yeah. writing, crafting them for hours, but I know he it's, hasn't because like exactly he, I, I, you just kind of see him staring <laughs> off in the space, his head's bobbing back and forth as he's doing it. Yeah, uh, real big toast head for the audience. I I surprise him. I'm like Paul, how about a pick of the week? Because we don't always do them, and then Paul just like fires off this beautiful thing. Anyway, uh, tonight on the show we're talking about hyperkalemia with everybody's favorite nephrologist, Dr. Joel Toff. We talk about the etiology. Uh, we talk about treatments for acute and chronic hyperkalemia. Uh, lots of questions from social media were answered on this one. I learned a lot. I had never used loop diuretics and saline at the same time. Uh, apparently, that's okay to do. You'll find out about that on the show. Also, maybe we should be using fludrocortisone for hyperkalemia. So if that sounds foreign, listen on. It'll all make sense. Our guest, as I said, is Dr. Joel Toff. He is better known by his much much cooler alter ego, at Kidney Boy. Those are his words, not mine. He started his personal blog, Precious Bodily Fluids, over 10 years ago. He is a co-founder of Neff Madness, Neff JC, and the NSMC Social Media Internship. He was recently recognized by the ASN, by the ASN as the 2017 recipient of the Robert G. Narens Award for Innovations in Teaching and you are about to find out why. So without further ado, here is our talk with Dr. Joel Toff. Hey, Matt, did you hear about the guy that had too many dates? I did not. Yeah, he died of palpitations, but here he's all K. <laughs> uh, you got any others? Um, did you hear about the couple that can't elope? No. I hear they're all K as well. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think it's I think that was I found that funny because you used the same joke that didn't work <laughs> twice in a row. <laughs> and I'm just envisioning you leafing through a big book of food puns, just just oh. looking for the right potassium ones. Uh Joel, I can't count how many times you've been on the show now, but we are thrilled to have you back. And I know the audience is going to be thrilled to have you back. But in case some of them have never heard of you, can you give them your one-liner? Yeah, I'm a 49-year-old white male with uh, no significant past medical history. I spend uh, way too much time on Twitter where I'm known as a uh, kidney boy. And uh, uh, in addition to being a clinical nephrologist, I'm a lifelong runner. Um, I spend most of my creative energy thinking about ways to use uh, modern communication techniques for medical education. And you do a great job at it because we we all follow you on Twitter and it's it's a delight. Um, <laughs> so how about you give the audience a pick of the week since we've kind of gone through all our normal questions with you. Why don't, why don't you give a pick of the week? Yeah. Uh, so we just recently, my family just recently got one of these Peloton exercise cycles and it's 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 really cool. Have you seen these things? These are, um, they're stationary bikes, but they have this huge screen and they connect to a studio in New York where they stream spin classes to you. And, uh, you'll join a spin class and there'll be hundreds of people from all over the United States that are participating in these classes. And they kind of give you uh, live statistics that are updating all the time. And everybody's got nicknames and you know that, you know, the, uh, the, you see these people that are, are, faster than you or working harder than you and they're just they're taunting you they're you know like <laughs> they're like wine girl you're like i'm not gonna let wine girl beat me <laughs> and it is it is really it's really compelling i mean i've never been uh I'm, a, I'm kind of an outdoor runner and i've always kind of scoffed at these kind of stationary bikes and stationary uh uh treadmills but this one this one's cool i like it yeah just- this is critically important can the other people see you <laughs> There's no, at least as far as I can tell, there's no video thing. Okay. All right. Then this is much more appealing to me already. Good. <laughs> and just to be 100% transparent here, um, Peloton is not a sponsor of the podcast. We are open to it. Um, <laughs> That's, that is true, Paul. We yeah, are open to it. So my pick of the week is your local library. And I'm going to qualify that by saying the local- like a li- jump rope. So yeah, kind of like a jump rope, Paul. Uh, the, so your local library. So this is something that I got into when I was in San Antonio. This is probably six years ago now. I discovered they had a they were advertising this free uh, local library, and they were having eBooks at the time. It was a relatively newer thing that a library would have eBooks that you could check out. So uh, we joined the San Antonio. They had an e library, and then they also had your local public library. And just like libraries, let you check out like fifty paper books at a time. And some libraries have like unlimited, but then they have these apps associated with them. The two most common that I've seen are Hoopla or Overdrive, and you can just get like thousands and thousands of ebooks and audiobooks. And I mean, this is many of the books that I've recommended on the podcast. A very high percentage um, I'm just getting from these libraries. So I recommend. I think it's probably an unused resource. But so I would recommend you check out your local library and uh, get do a not do card. what I did. So I have a book that's overdue for about seven years. I- I'm not sure how much I-, I owe. I think it's five cents per day. Is it Tropic of Cancer? Uh, is it- <laughs> <laughs> that is a solid reference. <laughs> no, I can't. I can't even remember what the book is. Honestly, <laughs> the med students have no idea what that's. Uh, oh, I'm just going to leave that sit, Paul. Paul, why, do, why don't you give a reference? Uh, give a pick of the week. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do both. Yeah, it's, and I, I have to say, I've never felt older than you than this episode where you're like, "Have you heard of this library thing? They're just letting you take books out for free." <laughs> um, but no, so I, so. Not to peek too much behind the curtain, but this is right around the time of New Year's. And so for New Year's Eve, my wife and I, I made her watch The Monster Squad, which she had never seen. Um, and it does not hold up as well as I th- hoped that it was. So we watched The Predator. Um, <laughs> and it, weirdly, both written by Shane Black. And that made me think of a better Shane Black movie. So here we go. I'm going to recommend The Nice Guys. It's a 2016 movie. It's directed and written by Shane Black, who um, I think also wrote the Lethal Weapon movies. He wrote... I believe the original Predator, a really funny screenwriter, and it's with you. May you've probably seen it, but probably like the commercials for it, but not actually watched it. It's Russell Crowe and Ryan Gosling. It's set in 1977 L.A. There's a lot of fidelity to the background, and it's um, sort of like a a comedy crime film. 
it is hilarious. I had no idea that Russell Crowe and especially Ryan Gosling had anything resembling comic timing, and they are just incredibly funny together. It is like all of my recommendations, not for children or for most adults. Um, but if you have a little bit of a dark sense of humor and sort of like neo-noir stuff, uh, I would recommend The Nice Guys uh, hmm. from 2016. I just found that I have a book still from my residency on my bookshelf, the library, uh, <laughs> my clinical guide to laboratory tests uh, by Norbert Tietz, which is an absolute classic. Um, I have no idea what my uh, library fine is now, but uh, I've had this for 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> you've out, you've outshone me yet again. <clears throat> All right, Stuart, last chance before we move on to our clinical case. All right, fine. My my pick of the week, um, it, it, anyone who, who knows me knows that I like video games. Um, there's one specific game that came out. I think it's worth a, a look if you if you have a PS4 or Steam. It's a, it's a game called Forgotten Anne. I, I think it's on other platforms as well. It's a, uh, an, an uh, independent developed title. It's really, really good. Just, I don't know, take a look at it. RPG type game or what? No, it's a it's like a it's a side scrolling two dimensional uh, adventure game. So almost like a like an old school point and click, but it's really really good. The story's really good. The animation's really good. It's surprisingly well done. All right, so there you have it. Four recommendations. Before we get on to the show, we do have a sponsor for tonight's episode. This is ACP's Internal Medicine Meeting 2019. As I mentioned, this is in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at the Pennsylvania Convention Center. The pre-course is from April 9th to 10th, and the full course is from April 11th to 13th. 2019. This is going to be an exceptional educational experience with world-class faculty from all over the country. There's over 170 scientific and practice-related sessions. I can tell you I attended last year. The clinical content was wonderful. I got to meet tons of people who I had only met before on Twitter uh, or on through social media. It was so much fun to meet people in person, get together with colleagues. Actually, some of my Curbsiders co-hosts I had never met before in person and got to meet them at the meeting. We will be there this year. I'm so excited to get back together with everybody uh, and to do do some learning and really dig into this meeting. It's going to be wonderful. Of course, you can earn CME to fulfill your state requirements. So join thousands. Uh, hopefully, this meeting will be bigger than last year. I think last year there was around 11,000 people attending, and I think we can we can beat that in Philadelphia. It is going to be a great meeting. So please register for ACP's Internal Medicine Meeting 2019 today. And remember that ACP members get the lowest rates when they register before January 31st. Learn what the ACP meeting has in store for you at annualmeeting.acponline.org, and we really hope to see you there. And now we will go on to a clinical case from Cashlack Memorial Hospital, and uh, I believe this is one, Joel, that you had seen. So this was a 66-year-old white male. He was coming in with a chief complaint of cough and fever, and he had been started on trim sulfa, trimethoprim, uh, sulfamethoxazole, if that's how you say it, three days ago. And he has a past medical history, CKD3, type 2 diabetes, hypertension. His, uh, his basic metabolic panel, he's got a sodium of 140, a potassium of 5.7, chloride is 110, his bicarbonate is 21, his BUN is 18, and his creatinine is 1.4, glucose 124. So Joel, this is this is actually a case that you wrote. So I'm just going to read because I I thought they were quite funny. So you you gave the choices. How would you manage the potassium? A. You call that hyperkalemia? Do nothing. Uh, B. Stop the ACE, ARB, and trim sulfa. C. Some combination of IV calcium, nebulized albuterol, insulin, and glucose. Or D. 30 grams of oral kaexalate. Or E. Answers B, C, and D. So. Uh, we're going to kind of hit all these things in general, but why don't we start with just the diagnosis of hyperkalemia? Does this patient have hyperkalemia? So the best clue to whether they have hyperkalemia is when you look up the labs, if there's an H next to the potassium value, <laughs> then you've got hyperkalemia. It's just as, it's as easy as that. That's, right? that's how patients do it. I know that. It, <laughs> right and the, and right, you always get in that call. I've looked at my labs doc and I got to go over. The, I, you know the MZV is a bit elevated. I want to talk about that. I'm making the special appointment to see. It. No, yeah, uh, 
you know, the, the diagnosis of hyperkalemia is straightforward. That's not where the trickiness comes in. It's just, it, you know, how do you interpret that, that elevated potassium? And um, my dad's a, my dad's a, a surgeon and, uh, and he always impresses me with his knowledge of just general internal medicine. Like he's, he's a good internist as a surgeon, which is always just kind of a bit embarrassing. <laughs> um, and he was telling me about a case of hyperkalemia he had the other day. And, he, you know, they were in the, they were in pre-op holding and they got some routine labs before they went to the OR and the patient had a potassium of 6.2 and his resident was running around with his, chi- like a chicken with his head cut off. And my dad said, just recheck it. Right. Cause I'm, I'm sure this patient doesn't really have hyperkalemia because it's a healthy person going for a cosmetic procedure. They're not on an ACE or an ARB. Like they had no reason to have hyperkalemia. Right. My, and, you know, my dad reasoned that very reasonably. And sure enough, they repeated it and it was fine. And, you know, probably the most common cause of an elevated potassium is just what we call pseudo hyperkalemia. You know, the most important thing to understand about potassium physiology is that this is an intracellular ion, you know, somewhere between 98 and 99 percent of total body potassium is located inside the cells. It doesn't take a lot of hemolysis or cell destruction to release a small amount of potassium and dramatically increase the serum potassium. And uh, this can happen with uh, someone who's very enthusiastic about pumping their fist right before the blood draw. It can happen with a difficult uh, blood draw where there's some trauma or they are not able to get a good flow uh, with the blood coming into the uh, syringe. And you can get disruption of those red cells and you get a little potassium leaks out and that potassium shoots up. And so Whenever you see that elevated potassium, you want to think, does this make sense, right? If the creatinine is nine and the bicarb is four and the patient's on lisinopril, aldactone, potassium supplements, yeah, that potassium makes sense, right? But if in other situations, if it doesn't make sense, get a repeat. Joel, I, I think you told me that a pneumatic tube system might be involved. Is that true? Yeah. So this, there's... <laughs> Right. Um, there's a couple of situations where you can get pseudo hyperkalemia without problems with a blood draw, with a nice clean blood draw. But if they have um, a platelet count right around a million, they'll get uh, when those platelets are activated, they release potassium, they release that intracellular potassium. And if you have elevated white cell count, so usually white cell counts over about 100,000 right around there, especially in CLL, so chronic uh lymphocytic leukemia, those white cells are particularly fragile. And when the uh, blood is bumped or disrupted, they will release intracellular potassium. And there's a couple of great case reports and they're about uh, blood being transported by pneumatic tube and the bumps on the pneumatic tube ride were enough to rupture the red cells and um, <laughs> and cause hyperkalemia. And in both, I think in both of the case reports that I'm thinking of, the critical test was giving the blood draw sample to the medical student to walk down to the lab, right? <laughs> right? If you can treat your medical student like a pneumatic tube, <laughs> you can get a clean uh, potassium measurement. And so uh, you know, it's, it's something to consider. Uh, you know, Those patients are usually pretty recognizable. You're already worried about the patient. They got a white cell count of 100,000. Uh, just be aware that that potassium uh, may not be true. And there actually was a, a pretty pretty dramatic example of this. This is a case, not my patient, but a case report in uh, uh, American Journal of Kidney Disease where a patient had a white count of close to 300,000 and their admission potassium was 6.2, but within hours it was over 10. And di- uh, nephrology was consulted and they put in a line and they started dialysis on this patient with a zero oh. K bath. That means they were dialyzing them against a dialysate with zero potassium. This is something that... Uh, I don't think many people do anymore. Uh, that zero potassium baths precipitate a lot of arrhythmias. There's a lot of concern about precipitating cardiac arrest from a very rapid reduction in potassium. But that's what they did in this case, and it was all pseudo hyperkalemia. When they actually measured the potassium accurately at the start of dialysis, it was 3.2. Oh, and by the time and they, the, I mean, you, you want to point to the, the nephrologist as not being smart, but they were they were suspicious of this because the patient had no EKG changes whatsoever with a potassium of 10 and um, or a th- theor- theoretical potassium of 10. And uh, they 
when they got an accurate, when they finally got an accurate measurement, the potassium was already down to 2.3. And they uh, switched the bath to a 4K bath and they continued dialysis until they raised the potassium back up to normal. And then they stopped the dialysis. This might not be the right place for this question, but you know, I'll just trust what it have exists in post. But what oftentimes when we get the lab results back, it will helpfully tell us that a specimen is hemolyzed. When is it okay to not be reassured by that? Like, are there certain other things that we should look at that hemolysis may not just be hemolysis, or is that not a concern? Yeah, my, my favorite one, I, I have a I have an EKG that I always show, and it and the potassium was listed as 9.7, and it's a wildly hemolyzed specimen, and the EKG looks horrible, right? It's, it's, it's one step away from a sine wave, you know, and this is a case where I think it's a good idea to get an EKG. They're not great tests, but... Um, the failure of an EKG is primarily in sensitivity, but its specificity is pretty good. That if you see an EKG that looks classically like hyperkalemia, it's probably hyperkalemia. And um, uh, and in this case, it was, the lab listed this as, as hemolyzed, but it was clearly a true hyperkalemia. And so, uh, um, yeah, I'm not sure if I have better guidance than that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, if the patient codes. <laughs> yeah. one of our, Maybe that was real. <laughs> one of our comments from Facebook was from a friend. He's like, is it true that the first symptom of hyperkalemia is often death? Like that's, you know, that's something that kind of is floating around. It's it, because uh, if you read it in textbooks, it says, oh, yeah, muscle weakness can be a sign of hyperkalemia or irregular heart heart rate. But when I've read it in the Sabatine book, the pocket medicine book, it's like the there can be no EKG changes before the patient basically just codes. So that scared me enough that I, I usually don't like the, I don't put much in the EKG unless I see something, then that's information. But like you said, that's a, the sensitivity, not great. Yeah. So why don't, why don't we, why don't we kind of hit the EKG since we've kind of stumbled across it already. So, um, there's a nice study of uh, dialysis patients where they just looked at uh, T wave amplitude and related it to potassium, and there was no relationship, no significant relationship. P, le- P value was a 0.11. Um, and then there's a, another trial that just looked at a uh, retrospective analysis. They got a bunch of EKGs of patients with hyperkalemia, and they went back and they analyzed them. And the sensitivity when they when they were just looking at T wave changes. Even for patients with potassium between seven and nine, looking for T wave changes, sensitivity was only thirty nine percent. You're missing sixty wow. percent of hyper of real severe hyperkalemia with the EKG, and probably the most frightening part about it is, yeah, you know, I think it was ninety patients that they started with, but there were fourteen patients that had damaging arrhythmias or cardiac arrest. And the sensitivity of the EKG in that population was only 50%. Yeah. And so even the, even the ones that are going to have horrible outcomes, that EKG not necessarily going to be helpful. And so I'm not, I'm not sure if it should be reassuring. And it really worries me um, that a lot of the guidelines say, hey, don't need to treat that hyperkalemia until you see an EKG change. I'm, I'm really with what you said about the first symptom can be death. And as that potassium starts to march up, I start to get real nervous and I'm not so cavalier about not treating that. I know that's going to be one of the main questions is like kind of thresholds for initiating like the acute therapies for hyperkalemia. And then later in the show, we'll get to kind of the chronic management of people with chronic hyperkalemia or less acute hyperkalemia. Yeah, there's some pretty interesting data um, on when to treat. There's this... uh, there's a study by uh, Einhorn, I think the, the lead author is Lisa Einhorn, and she looked at um, a quarter million veterans and two million blood draws. And of that, she found 60,000 60, of them that were hyperkalemic. But then she filtered, she said, how many of those patients that had hyperkalemia died in the next 24 hours? Okay, so there's 6,000 patients that had hyperkalemia followed by death within 24 hours, which I, to me, that's a, that is a outcome that I'm interested in. There's a lot of studies that'll look at and they'll say, Hey, we took a let, we have a lab value that's hyperkalemia. And then we looked at mortality for the next six months or the next 12 months. And I, I never know what to do with that data. I never know, you know, how could that death seven months later actually be related to the yeah. potassium that you got, but within 24 hours that catches my attention. 
I'm not sure if it's causal, but there certainly looks that, that association has got to be tighter. And, um, you know, and what she found is uh, patients with potassium is between 5.5 to 6, no CKD had a odds ratio of mortality of 10 compared to patients wow. with normal potassium, right? That's frightening. And if the potassium was greater than six, that odds ratio for death went up to 31. I don't see people dying of hyperkalemia, uh, hyperkalemic arrhythmias with potassiums of 5.7. I'm not sure what the cause of death is, but it's, it's a signal. Like hyperkalemia, you shouldn't have hyperkalemia. And patients that have it are profoundly ill. Yeah. And what are we listing the threshold? Is is 5.5 like a good threshold or do you do you consider hyperkalemia above five? I, I, I think I, different sources probably have slightly different answers to that. At my hospital, ele- elevated potassium is considered 5.5 and higher. What's it, what's it at your hospital? I, I think that's about it. And that just kind of throughout my training, that was where I was taught that like I pay, a te- I pay a lot more attention if I see 5.5 or higher. You know, five to five point five. I'm like, okay, I'll I'll look at the med list and stuff. Five point five. I'm like, getting. I'm getting an EKG. I'm thinking, does this patient need telly? I'm I'm looking at the med list. Do I need to give an acute therapy for this patient? That's kind of my my thought process. But we of course want to know what you do when you see five point five and someone with a plausible reason for having hyperkalemia. Yeah, I I will usually uh, I'll look at adjusting their med lists. And we'll take no acute action for anything less than probably 6.2, 6.3. Like, I want to correct it, but I'm not sure if I do any benefit if I corrected it within the next hour or two. Mm -hmm. Okay? But it's an abnormal lab value, and I'm going to pay extra attention to them, and I'm going to work on correcting it. I just don't know. It, you know, if you could check an EKG at a potassium in 5.5 to 6, I don't think you ever see anything. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, what's your experience? You see much when you check those potassium? Did you check an EKG at a five point seven? Usually, no. Yeah, I, that, that's that's my experience. Is that there's not, you're not gonna. I don't see typical EKG changes until you get a potassium uh, uh, north of six and a half, closer to seven. Mm-hmm. Joel, so a follow up question there. I was I was mentioning Telly. Do you find that helpful? Like, like let's just let's just say this patient. Let's say we had our our patient here. In the hospital, K is five point seven. The med list has some things on there that would make that would be plausible that he has true hyperkalemia. Uh, what what should what what sh- t- action should we take in the hospital to uh, to deal with this? You know, in the, in those potassiums that are in the, kind of the lower half of six six and a half and below, I'm mean, used telemetry. I don't think you're going to get a lot of additional information from that. If the potassium starts to get a lot higher than that, be something that I would consider. Um, but mostly, I would want I would focus. You know, as your potassium starts to get north of six and a half, I'd really focus on acute management. Um, you mean not all patients need telemetry? <laughs> there's a few that don't. <laughs> That's a whole nother can of worms, Stuart. <laughs> 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 things we do for no reason. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's funny. We're, there's a, patients that have irritated myocardium. So there's a actually a, a, a nice study in JAMA that looked at um, patients that were admitted for acute myocardial infarction between 2000 and 2008, and um, they looked at what levels of potassium were associated with uh, death and ventricular fibrillation. And their primary outcome was something they called the post-admission mean serum potassium, where they took all the potassiums, excluding the admission potassium, and they averaged them out. And if that potassium was over 4.5, there was an there was an increased risk of mortality. And if it was over five, there was an increased wait, risk of VFib. Wait, 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 wait. So because like, the cardiologists are always telling us that they want the potassium over four. Right. So this, so four to five was what the, was the dogma that I heard, right? Four to five. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. And, and they would much prefer it to be a little bit higher than a little bit lower. Um, but this showed pretty symmetric U shaped curve with increased mortality at below 3.5 and above 4.5. And the, the article points out that a lot of the data that they were that talked about a higher serum potassiums 
were from an era before beta blockers, an era before re, uh, revascularization. And so uh, they didn't think that, the, and, the, and the studies were a lot much smaller. I think the largest one from those those times was a thousand patients. This was thirty eight thousand admissions for acute myocardial infarction. Mm-hmm. Okay. They looked. They looked at. I think it was like all the patient, all the hospitals that used Cerner's uh, EMR, which is actually pretty cool when you can start to take an uh, uh, electronic medical record and kind of go across hospital systems. Joel, I wanted to throw you one of the questions from. Uh, from uh, social media here. So one of the questions was, can you can you talk about the acute treatments for hyperkalemia? Let's let's say that this this same patient, we uh, uh, like a couple hours later, let's say eight hours later, his potassium six point two. We decide it's trending up. We're we're not comfortable. We want to initiate treatment. A- and the question was, can you talk about like how you choose which therapy to give? And the duration of therapies, and like they said, should everyone get calcium gluconate? That was one of the other other questions. What about polystyrene sulfonate? Yeah. So let's. The first thing I, I like to do is this patient's a CKD three patient, and so if we can use the kidney to clear the potassium, let's use the kidney to clear the potassium. And in addition, this patient um, is a, a is a diabetic and is elderly and uh, had uh, a non-anion gap. Eh, we're not sure if it's a metabolic acidosis, but it had a decreased bicarb and a uh, and a no-anion gap. It could be respiratory alkalosis, but it also could be a, a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, which would fit nicely with the patient's history uh, on, on an ACE inhibitor on uh, trim sulfa. So in this case, I would be... Uh, I'd be happy to reach for fludrocortisone. I would be happy to reach for uh, a, a loop diuretic with saline. There are a number of options in patients that make urine to lower the potassium without reaching for um, sodium polystyrene or K-axalate, which is a, uh, a drug that deserves a, a dedicated conversation. Let's reserve that for the aneuric patient because that's where you really want to bring in your uh uh, potassium reasons. Um, so if the patient makes urine, first thing and a super common cause of hyperkalemia is going to be urinary obstruction. So uh, urinary obstruction classically causes uh, hyperkalemia out um, uh, beyond what you would expect for its degree of renal failure. It really causes a specific uh, potassium secretion defect in the kidney. And so one of the fastest ways that you can correct hyperkalemia is see if they're obstructed and if they are, place a Foley and relieve that obstruction. And so this patient who's a male, right age for uh, benign prostatic hypertrophy, get a bladder scan right away. And if they've got a big full bladder, get that drained. Love that. I I don't know that I knew that. I bet you Stuart knew that. Well, I, I just want to ask a, a no, I didn't. I just want to ask a question actually about the. <laughs> hold, wait, hold on, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. He never misses an opportunity to tell you what he doesn't know. <laughs> that was the first time I've ever heard that. Can we just all let it sit and all savor it for just a minute? Uh, all right, actually, go ahead. So, so the the question that that I wanted to throw to you was um, because I've seen this dose wrong so many times. What is a dosage of albuterol for hyperkalemia? How would you actually dose that if if you were going to give that? I use 20 milligrams of albuterol. And, and to give some idea, how many NEB treatments is that? That's eight to back to back. When you write for 20 milligrams of albuterol, you will get a call from the respiratory therapist <laughs> going, did you really mean, tw- you meant two milligrams, right? No, 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 I meant 20 milligrams. Your standard uh, mm-hmm. COPD or asthma dose is uh, 2.5 milligrams. And so it's a, it's a lot of albuterol. You will see tachycardia. It is safe even though you're trying to prevent arrhythmias and you're predisposing them to SVT with what, the drug. What, what about for patients that are on long-acting uh, beta agonists? Um, does that affect the efficacy of the albuterol in the short term? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, That's a good question, Stuart. I, I, maybe, Stuart. There, there, I bet, there's actually I bet a, there's a newer one on the market, Olodaterol, that's, that has a half-life of 24 hours. So the question is, like, is there any utility to short-acting beta agonists now? I, I, th- I, I bet know. you somebody on Twitter will know the answer to that. 
Let's rewind a, a, a little bit and let's make sure. That, so what we have is a patient with a modestly elevated potassium, but it's going in the wrong direction and we're concerned. We're going to first, we're going to take a look, make sure they're not obstructed. Secondly, we're going to get an acute check. The other thing that can cause your potassium to rise dramatically is uh, hyperglycemia. So what you get here is as the glucose goes up, it increases the osmolality outside of the cells. Water goes from the cells and it leaves. And as it leaves, you get something called solute drag that brings all that intracellular potassium along with it. Since they have hyperglycemia, there's a relative lack of insulin and insulin is important for moving potassium into the cells. And so kind of all that is pushing your potassium up and it's also super easy to correct. We all know that you, for acute treatment of hyperkalemia, you can give IV insulin and glucose, but be aware that if they have hyperglycemia driving their hyperkalemia, just bring down the glucose, right? Just give them the IV insulin. Don't throw on the glucose on top of that. And that, if you can correct that glucose, you can bring that potassium down beautifully. I have a, I have a, uh, a case that I always love showing. It's this, um, it's this uh, Chem Seven of a of a diabetic dialysis patient. They've got a you know they're di- they're di- they're a dialysis patient, so their creatinine's nine, um, but their potassium is nine and their glucose is nine hundred and twenty five, and they start an insulin drip, and uh, one hour later the potassium is down to five point two. Right, 9.9 to 5.2, and that's just from giving them the insulin, lowering that glucose down, shifting that potassium into the cells. And that, you know, that's that turned what sounded like an incredible acute emergency with potassium of 9.9 into kind of routine, slightly elevated potassium. And all they did was give them insulin. And so respect that serum glucose, correct that before reaching for. Uh, albuterol, k dialysis, all those other therapies, A, they're going to take a lot longer, and uh, B, this is super effective. So again, keep in mind what could be driving that hyperkalemia, and, you're, and you can fix it pretty easily. Joel, I, I just wanted to ask you, CashLack has a really conservative pol- policy on this, and this is uh, multiple multiple different CashLacks that I've worked at, uh, CashLack North, CashLack South, CashLack Northeast. They they all had this, so basically they say they say that it, it, you have to call a rapid response to shift somebody and give them the insulin and glucose unless they're in ER or the intensive care unit because there had been so many instances of hypoglycemia occurring. So how do we mitigate that? Yeah, so this is this is something I think uh, is not well recognized. I think Cashlax really ahead of the curve in terms of uh, managing this. Uh, there's been a couple of studies that have looked at the risk of hypoglycemia following acute management of hyperkalemia, and it's pretty consistently about 13, 14% of patients are going to get glucose is below 60. And, uh, you know, what I see in our hospital is there's a, uh, there's an easy way to order the insulin and glucose from the EMR, but that order does not require nurses to do any follow up of, um, AccuChecks. And so, uh, this is, you know, you just got to be conscious of this, that you're pushing IV insulin. We're not used to using IV insulin. Uh, a lot of these patients will have chronic kidney disease and the kidney is responsible for a metabolizing insulin. And so when you have chronic kidney disease, you'll metabolize less of that insulin. And two, it's responsible for a lot of gluconeogenesis. And so the, these patients will have less of an ability to protect protect themselves from hypoglycemia. And so you got a population that has increased risk of hypoglycemia. You're giving them IV insulin. We're much more used to using sub-Q insulin, and people just don't respect how much hypoglycemia we can cause with this therapy. And honestly, that 13 or 15% of patients developing hypoglycemia, I think, is really just the tip of the iceberg. I think we don't see a lot of the hypoglycemia we cause because we're not checking the acute checks frequently after we do one of these intracellular shifts. So you think like once an hour for three to four hours, is that reasonable? I tend to do once every half hour. Okay. I uh, continue monitoring the glucose pretty intensively for six hours after the insulin goes in. Okay, I like it. How long does this treatment last? That's one of the other main questions I'd like you to answer with each of these kind of more uh, uh, like Band-Aid type therapies for hyperkalemia. Uh, 
Right. You're, you're looking at usually about four to six hours on um, insulin glucose and, um, and albuterol. Okay. Yeah, because again, they're good, and that's exactly right, that you have not corrected the situation. You've just put a Band-Aid on, on that by shifting the potassium inside the cells, and it'll come back out. I wanted to swing you back. You, you had mentioned fludrocortisone. I have never used that for this indication, so I'm very excited to hear the logistics of that, like dosing some specifics and and how we would might track that. And then uh, I also want to ask you a little bit about giving Lasix and fluids at the same time, which is yeah, I'm just very interested in in the logistics which of I've that made as fun well. Of a million times, yeah, that's exactly. Right, that, that, that's forbidden, right? You're never supposed to give fluids and a diuretic, right? And there are a couple of exceptions, and correcting electrolyte abnormalities is one of those exceptions. Mm-hmm. And um, we, we, uh, you can do it with uh, hyponatremia in some treatment protocols, and you can do it for hypercalcemia in some treatment protocols, and you can do it for hyperkalemia. And that um, uh, what we're, we're trying to do is use the side effect of these diuretics, which is increased caloresis, increased potassium excretion in the urine, and we're trying to avoid the, what is typically the primary effect of these drugs, which is to get rid of sodium. We want to neutralize that unless they have some, uh, you know, they're fluid overloaded, but if they're not, you don't, you want to be sodium neutral. And so you give the fluids to replace those fluid losses. Right. And in addition, um, by you're going to get more effective. You know, if you take a look at the two um, factors that regulate potassium handling in the kidney. One of them is going to be um, aldosterone, and the other one is going to be uh, distal sodium delivery. And uh, uh, by increasing distal sodium delivery, you're going to get increased potassium excretion, right? One of the, if you take a look at the- um, I can put your figure from the, you know, from the book in there too. Right. So cortical collecting duct, uh, which is where, uh, which is the kind of the business end of the nephron when it comes to potassium handling. You have a multi-step process to excrete potassium. Step one is sodium is reabsorbed through the epithelial sodium channel. And when the sodium is reabsorbed, it leaves a negative charge in the tubule. That negative charge it acts like a magnet to help suck out potassium. And so uh, diuretics loop diuretics or thiazide type diuretics will block proximal sodium reabsorption. So you get increased distal delivery of sodium, which allows more of that sodium to be reabsorbed by the uh, epithelial sodium channel. Same thing about saline. Saline is going to also uh, increase that distal delivery of sodium. So essentially what I'm hearing from you is to expect a page from the respiratory therap- therapist the uh, nurse for getting the gluc- the uh, Accutrex every 30 minutes, and now the pharmacist for the diuretic with saline <laughs> and plus my acid the fluid or cortisone. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, your, 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 your page will light up. Okay. Okay, so so I, I got this. <laughs> I, what I like about this, Joel, it's, I've used the Lasix, I, I've used furosemide to treat hyperkalemia in patients who are volume overloaded because I'm like, oh, they're volume overloaded already. Now I'll get rid of the potassium and I'll treat their volume overload You know, at the same time. Now what you're saying is for patients who are euvolemic, we want to keep them euvolemic essentially, and we're going to give them saline along with the furosemide or the loop diuretic, whatever one we're giving. I love it. So fludrocortisone, how is that working? <laughs> so a lot of times patients, you know, one of the more common scenarios where patients get hyperkalemia is in the type 4 RTA. And the type 4 RTA mm. is going to be a, is classically a hypoaldo, hyporenin complication of diabetes. And if they have low aldo, is there a way that we can replace that aldo? Yeah, we have pharmaceutical aldosterone. It's called fludrocortisone. Standard dose for people that have adrenal insufficiency is usually 0.1 daily or twice daily. And um, if I am treating hyperkalemia, again, this is not a very rapid treatment. It is something that's going to treat it over days, maybe a day or two. I will put them on a 0.1 or 0.2 twice a day, a PO. And um, it works well at reducing the potassium, but you're giving them aldosterone. It's going to raise their blood pressure. It's going to um, increase uh, sodium retention. And so it's not unusual to see edema in these patients. Um, 
And uh, we know there's a lot of benefits to blocking aldosterone in heart failure patients. And so I'm nervous about using this long term, especially in anybody who's got anybody, any type of cardiac disease. This really may be a, uh, a great way to fix the electrolytes at the expense of uh, a lot of other organ systems. And so I, I do use it occasionally. I just I think about it carefully before I do it. Again, I don't think there's a concern if you're going to use it for a day or two, if you just want to get over somebody who's got some uh, hyperkalemia. But um, I think there's real questions about the long-term safety of this treatment uh, in patients with cardiac disease. Got it. One of the other questions from social was, when are you reaching for calcium gluconate? Does, do all patients get that when you first diagnose hyperkalemia? You know, let's say they're they're above your threshold of worry, which you said was like 6.2-ish. So they're above 6.2. Are they all getting calcium gluconate as a first step? And how long does that does that last? Can, can, I, can I add one more layer onto that onion? Um, and uh, specifically, is there any indication for calcium chloride over gluconate? Right. So um, so the active ingredient here is uh, calcium. And the more calcium you give, the more the effect that we see. And the effect that we're looking for usually is normalization of an EKG. Calcium chloride uh, vial for vial has three times as much calcium as calcium gluconate. So the dose is always a gram. So if you give a gram of calcium chloride, you've given three times as much calcium as if you give a gram of calcium gluconate. I don't know what gluconate is, but apparently it's really heavy, right? <laughs> and so there's not as much calcium in the gram. Um, and so, uh, and there's actually, there's actually, uh, in pediatrics, they actually did a study where they compared uh, EKG changes, and there was a more dramatic effect with the um, the calcium chloride than calcium gluconate, exactly what you would expect. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the guidelines will say not to, to reserve calcium for patients that have EKG changes, and that to repeat the doses until you've normalized the EKG. So if you, and they typically exclude T-wave changes, they're really looking for a widened QRS uh, complex and that you give calcium and you want to see that uh, EKG narrow. And if it doesn't, you're supposed to repeat the dose. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that I see missed more often than not is that they'll give a dose of calcium and they'll never get a follow-up EKG and they'll have no idea if it was effective or uh, uh, whether they need subsequent doses. And calcium will work almost instantly Almost as soon as that blood hits the myocardium, you should normalize the EKG, but it will not last long. And so these patients oftentimes need repeated dosing. I will tell you that I give calcium whenever I get a little bit nervous, um, and not only when there's EKG changes, but it's, you know, when, if you're, when you're doing that, I think you're treating yourself because yeah. uh, you don't know if you've given enough calcium, because there's no EKG changes to look for, and you don't know when to repeat the dose. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that I'm not immune to that uh, instinct. So it's essentially you're you're giving the dose. As soon as that bag's done, you're checking an EKG. If the changes are still there, another dose right away and so forth. That's right. And That's then right. The, the limitation for, for listeners, calcium chloride, it, it can cause like caustic, like if it extravasates, it's a big problem. So usually they won't let you give it through a peripheral line. So usually calcium gluconate is being given is my understanding. But I guess if someone has a, no, if Matt, someone has a sine it. wave, exactly right. if That's someone exactly. has a sine wave, maybe, maybe you'd, you'd risk the calcium chloride if you had a good line, but. I've never heard it pronounced extravasate. How do you say it, Stuart? Extravasate. Extravasate. I you I mispronounce words all the time, so thank you. It was extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> One of my superpowers is mispronouncing words. Um, all right, so that's calcium. I know one of the big ticket items, a lot, SPS. Joel, can you talk about that? Does it work? Yeah. SPS is sodium polystyrene sulfate, and it is uh, a treatment that was uh, – yeah, I think it was grandfathered in uh, to the FDA regulation. So there are two studies that were used for the approval of SPS. Uh, they were both in the 1961 New England Journal of Medicine. They're both uh, embarrassingly bad by modern standards. 
one of them has controls, but it shows that the SPS is no better than sorbitol. And uh, the other one has no controls and has about 30 some odd patients that whose potassium improved, but there's lots of possible explanations for why that potassium improved. Some of the patient's renal function was getting better, pHs were getting better, um, just not compelling data by any modern standards. So there was two studies in 1961 that are trash, um, but they were enough to get this drug approved in the early days of the, of the FDA. Um, and then there wasn't a lot until... Uh, uh, there was a study in six dialysis patients, and they kind of, uh, this was in 1998, and they ran them through uh, five different uh, uh, concoctions to increase uh, stool potassium. And SPS was in uh, a few of those different uh, concoctions. And, and what they found was that there was no significant effect at all using SPS in these dialysis patients to increase stool potassium, which completely blew up the whole theory on how these drugs worked. Now, part of the problem was these patients were not hyperkalemic to begin with. They just took dialysis patients that were stable. Their serum potassiums were five, and they gave them uh, 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 SPS or uh, SPS and phenothaline, which is X-lax, or uh, SPS and sorbitol, and they really couldn't find any effect at all from uh, uh, SP. This really, and the, and the fact that they measured the potassium content of the stool really kind of blew up the theory that uh, this SPS worked. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, but... I think it was really, and and this kind of uh, led to people kind of reevaluating the data and said, you know what, we've been using this stuff for 50 years. We don't have a good database to support our use, using it. But in 2015, um, a, a real randomized trial of dialysis of patients with CKD stages four and five with hyperkalemia were randomized to placebo or KXLate, and. Um, these patients had uh, remarkably were able to lower the potassium. They Their endpoint was to normalize the potassium, and a lot of patients failed to normalize potassium because their potassium went too low. <laughs> right, right. And again, this was not using this was not using uh, SPS in a few hours. This was a testing it daily over time. And but the data is pretty compelling. The stuff works, and it fits with, uh, you know, uh, decades of personal experience, which again is not a randomized controlled trial, but, you know, I've, I've seen patient after patient who is anuric and is hyperkalemic and they get SPS and the next day their potassium is improved. And I've seen that enough. I'm trying to, you know, I can't, I, I rack my brain for some other explanation for why that potassium went down and I can't come up with it. And I think we've got now pretty compelling data that, SPS does work. It does lower the serum potassium. But the other issue with SPS uh, comes from a, uh, a study in 1987. This was a, a surgery study in which they had, um, uh, it was a case series of five patients that received SPS and sorbitol for hyperkalemia, and they developed con uh, colonic necrosis. And four of these patients ended up dying. There is definitely an association with KXL, or excuse me, SPS, sodium polystyrene, and colonic necrosis. You'll talk to uh, nephrologists and you'll ask them if they've had patients that develop this, and lots of them have had it. The classic scenario is a patient who's right after a kidney transplant. And so uh, oftentimes, right after a transplant, the new fresh graft won't start working right away. It's called delayed graft function. And um, the surgeons always want to avoid doing dialysis in that situation because uh, it gets those patients that receive dialysis get categorized as delayed graft function. And if you look at their outcomes, those patients do particularly worse. Now, I don't know if there's any benefit to avoiding dialysis when they need to, or those patients will also do worse, but the surgeons really try to avoid dialysis in a fresh transplant. And there, and one of the things that'll push them to do dialysis is hyperkalemia. And so they've oftentimes been, uh, will direct or push using these resin binders to avoid 
hyperkalemia and avoid uh, dialysis. And a lot of them have developed this uh, colonic necrosis. Um, and this is exact. well, this, my one case of clear clonic necrosis that I had wasn't a transplant patient. It wasn't a fresh transplant. The uh, kidney had been in for a few months, almost a year, but uh, she had a, a horrible hospitalization, prolonged partial colectomy, all this because of uh, a KX late four hyperkalemia. And so once people began to recognize that this was an association that there was colonic necrosis with um, with SPS. Uh, the question was, how dangerous is this? How common is it? And like I said, if, uh, if you talk to nephrologists, most of them will have a story of one patient who got SPS and then developed this colonic necrosis. But most people only have one, and that's my case. I only have, I only have one. There was a, a nice review in the American Journal of Medicine, 2013. The systemic review looked at 30 articles. It was 23 case reports and seven case re- case series for a total of 58 cases. That's just not that many cases, right? This stuff, we use a lot of um, sodium, uh, sodium polystyrene. So there was an article, a letter in the American Journal of Kidney Disease in uh, 1991 that said we were using uh, 35,000 kilograms of SPS per year. 35,000 kilograms represents about 1.5 million doses, assuming we're still using as much KX, uh, SPS as we did in uh, 1991, represents uh, 37 million uh, doses over uh, 25 years that the case series represents. So that's a denominator of 37 million, 58 cases over 37 million. Uh, that sounds way too rare for me to care about. But if you look at uh, maybe those cases there's 10 cases for every one that's reported. That's pretty realistic. That's still way too small of a denominator. If you get a, if you go all the way up to, for every case that's reported, there's a thousand cases that are unreported. That would be 58,000 cases and a risk of about 0.15%. And that sounds like a risky drug, but it doesn't sound terrifying. And it's hard to believe that there's a, 58,000 of these cases that have been, you know, a thousand of these cases, a thousand unreported cases for everyone that was reported. If that was, if the disease was that common, I think we would have uh, much more recognition of it. People would have a lot more experience with it. I mean, that would be a situation where this would be happening, you know, uh, monthly on every floor. I just don't think the disease is that common. My sense is this association is real, but it's rare and in situations where you need to use the drug, it's okay to use the drug. But lots of times people are using the drug when patients have good renal function and other options are available. And in that situation, we shouldn't be using it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying that uh, if someone has CKD3, kidneys are working, you you'd, you'd jump to a loop diuretic and saline ahead of that, um, maybe fludrocortisone ahead of that depending on the patient, change their meds around, et cetera. Nursing's going to love you. Now they're checking Accutrex and changing the bedding. <laughs> I'm not very popular in the hospital. <laughs> and, and and I think you had, in one of your slide sets I saw, you, you did mention that it, patients with a sick bowel, it makes you have some pause before you're going to be giving them SPS. Yeah, I, I'm reluctant to use SPS. I'm certainly reluctant for the patient that's already been admitted with a GI bleed or has, you know, a lower GI bleed, something that, or they're, you know, small bowel obstruction. There's a lot of patients that are in the hospital that I would avoid it absolutely. Yeah. So if they have uh, diseased bowels to begin with, it's a, I think it's a bad idea. Okay. I think the last uh, acute therapy that we wanted to bring up was sodium bicarbonate. Does does that work? So, if you're if the question is the patient has a potassium of seven point seven right now, and I want to lower that potassium right away, it is not a good therapy. So uh, there's been a number of uh, trials that have looked at it, and sodium bicarbonate has repeatedly failed to lower the potassium. Um, there are some analysis that say if your patient has metabolic acidosis. In that situation, it can help. Um, but one of my concerns is we know that raising the pH is going to lower the ionized calcium. 
right? Because as you raise the pH, you're gonna um, uh, you're pulling hydrogen ions off of the albumin. That's going to leave a space for calcium to be to bind to that albumin. So you're going to lower the ionized calcium, which is our primary antidote for the outcome that we want to avoid, which is the arrhythmia. And so I worry that pushing the sodium bicarbonate is neutralizing the highly effective calcium that you may have given previously. And so I, uh, I'm really hesitant to use sodium bicarbonate for the acute management of hyperkalemia. But when you have the question of a patient who has chronic uh, hyperkalemia, a patient with um, the, the, the type 4 RTA that we've already talked about, the diabetic patient who's running around with a, potassi- a bicarb of 21 or 19 and a potassium of 5.7 or 6.1, uh, I think oral bicarbonate is a great therapy there, and that's going to help the kidneys excrete additional potassium. Okay. Whether bicarb work, I think, depends on the scenario that you're using. But if it's part of your, quote, cocktail that you used in the acute management of hyperkalemia, I think you need to reevaluate that. Um, the data does not support the use of sodium bicarbonate in the treatment of uh, acute hyperkalemia. I feel like we've we've covered a lot of ground. I, I think we probably should go back to our original case at some point and, and talk about sort of what we think actually happened with our specific patient and sort of more the management of, since we've already started this discussion about chronic hyperkalemia, that might be the right transition point here. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, we have a patient who's got uh, uh, a new finding of hyperkalemia in the labs. We want to make sure that that's uh, not a pseudo hyperkalemia. Check the labs and make sure it's not mentioned to be um, hemolyzed. Uh, but we have a, a nice setup for hyperkalemia. We've talked about the patient has uh, diabetes, patients on presumably on an ACE inhibitor for their CKD stage three and diabetes. Uh, and now they've been, we've added uh, trim sulfa. And so uh, trim sulfa uh, blocks the epithelial sodium channel that was the very first step in renal excretion of potassium. And so this drug is going to reliably cause uh, an increase in potassium, whether that's enough to cause hyperkalemia or not is going to vary from patient to patient. But patients on uh, uh, RAS inhibition, so ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, patients with diabetes, these patients are set up for hyperkalemia, and oftentimes the addition of trim sulfa will push them over into hyperkalemia. And so I would look carefully at what the indication for that drug was. And I would stop it if you can. There's a, a guy named uh, Mike Fralick who uh, did a, an int- interesting analysis of um, medicine dispensing data and found that use of trim sulfa and patients that I think they were elderly patients that were on ACE inhibitors had a measurable increase in um, acute uh, sudden cardiac death. <laughs> yes. Right. It's, it's, it's horrible to think about, right? you got a patient who's got a sniffly nose. You're like, oh, just take some Bactrim. You'll be fine. <laughs> and, and you know, they end up in the morgue. You're like, oh, my God, what'd I do? And I think it's even, it's going to be a bigger issue now that we're with uh, urinary tract infections. You know, you used to be able to reach for uh, a quinolone for that. And now you're really going to yeah. be pushed to using uh, trim sulfa because it's got great, great urinary tract activity. But um, it, it, can, it can pack a punch. So the answer is stop stop the trim sulfa. Would you admit this patient to the hospital? That's one of the big questions I had. This this came up all the time when I was working uh, outpatient at Cashlack, where I'd like check labs always right at the end of my clinic day. Like I'm like oh yeah. my notes are done. Can I go home? And I check labs and I got I have like a K five point seven, a K five point nine. Someone on an ACE or an ARB or or trim sulfa. How how do you handle that? Like what's the sense of urgency there? Yeah, for me, I don't. I don't admit those patients. I uh, call them up. I stop the uh, RAS inhibition. Stop any other drugs that might be exacerbating this, and schedule the patient to come in for repeat labs in a day or two. So, Joel, this brings up to. I've had patients. I tell them that they have hyperkalemia. I call them. I say, "Listen, your potassium's high. I think it's some of the medicines we've got you on. We're going to stop those medicines. I want you to come in in a day or two. We're going to check your labs again." Uh, there's there's some certain foods that you might want to avoid just f- until we get this potassium under control. I tell them bananas and orange juice. Uh, 
then the patient, I see the patient three months later, they're like, I stopped eating bananas and orange juice completely. Uh, is there a certain diet that patients need to follow uh, if they've had, you know, hyperkalemia at some point or another? The nutritional component to hyperkalemia is probably uh, overemphasized. Um, if you take a look at the nature of the potassium in diet, it's not potassium chloride. It's almost entirely potassium phosphate and um, uh, and potassium citrate. But potassium phosphate um, actually increases uh, uh, renal excretion of potassium. So the additional phosphate is going to help clear potassium. Um, and so it's unclear to me how much this is really going to contribute to uh, hyperkalemia or is it that how beneficial those dietary changes are going to be. That said, I think it's always a good idea to tell people to lay off of uh, uh, the citrus fruits, um, to lay off of uh, tomato juice. I think tomato juice is the highest potassium content of anything that you can get. Um, uh, uh, Kiwi is supposed to be extremely high in potassium also, potatoes. Um, I think I'm sure they, Stuart yeah. is Google searching right now. <laughs> I, I, I actually no, not, never mind. I don't want to go into it. Okay. So uh, I think <laughs> I think I think the, I think those are reasonable things to say. I'm not convinced they uh, are a uh, real important part of your therapy. I really think, you know, if you if you take a look at like I always think about the etiology of hyperkalemia. I divide it into three phases, a potassium intake, transcellular uh, location of potassium, and potassium excretion. And all three of those can play a dramatic role in acute hyperkalemia. But if you're talking about chronic hyperkalemia, hyperkalemia that lasts day after day, month after month for your, months for your patient, that's always a failure of excretion, right? The others may contribute to that, but that chronic hyperkalemia is always going to be a failure of excretion, and that's where I think you need to focus your energy in terms of correcting it, not on the intake, but on getting rid of that potassium. And that's going to be adjusting their uh, RAS inhibitors. So you lower or eliminate the ACE inhibitors, add in a diuretic, uh, neutralize any kind of metabolic acidosis with um, oral bicarbonate. That's where the money is going to be to correct these patients that are in the outpatient scenario. I love it. So I just wanted to kind of throw this out there. So the foods that are highest in potassium, I, I kind of wanted to talk about it just briefly, are generally what are considered the healthier foods, hence the DASH diet, right? Higher in potassium, lower in sodium. Things like lentils, beans, salmon, poppy seeds, almonds, uh, quinoa, kale, all those are very, very high in potassium. And so one of the concerns that we, that that I run into in the outpatient setting is saying, hey, let's control your hyper your hypertension by increasing your potassium content. And then they, they come back and now the potassium is like 5.5. Um, they're not necessarily on an ACE or an ARB at that point. Um, what's the concern for uh, overshooting and overtreating when I'm trying to supplement their diet with high potassium, low sodium diet? My experience is that I have not seen dietary changes alone resulted in those those high potassiums. And I, I would continue to advise uh, healthy diets. The kidney is really good at ramping up potassium excretion. You know, again, if you run into hyperkalemia, if the lab the lab's not lying, if you had an elevated potassium, if they have got if they've got some high blood pressure, I would add a diuretic. But you know, if the potassium's elevated, I, I think you're gonna have to back off on that dietary advice. But I think that's going to be unusual. I think most patients are going to tolerate it just fine. Yeah. Also, I can't imagine a world where I'm like, Mrs. Smith, I'm going to need you to back off the camera. <laughs> just... <laughs> Too much. What chaos. a dream. That sounds great. Yes. Well, right. <laughs> bear in mind where I live and avocados are very, very high in potassium and everyone loves their uh, their their avocados and their uh, guacamole. So it's an it's an entirely millennial uh, clinic. It's all avocado <laughs> toast all the way down. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> me too, <a> Joel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joel. Though, I think I think some of the last things here. Uh, th this was asked repeatedly on Twitter. So, if maybe you could talk about the safety of potassium supplements when patients are on a diuretic, and then some of the newer medicines, which I don't have much experience with. Uh, I'm sure I'm pronouncing this wrong. Petirimer, and then there's this zirconium medication. Can you? Can those were. Those would be some of the last topics we'd want you to hit before we let you go. Right. So uh, we talked about caxalate. And so 
In addition to the concerns about the safety and the concerns about the efficacy, I think the safety issue is a little overblown, but I, it's a real issue. I just don't think it's a dramatic issue. And in terms of the efficacy, I'm sure that uh, SPS, I'm convinced that SPS works, but it's unpleasant to take, right? The nurses hate it. The patients hate it. It tastes bad. There are two new options. There's patiromir and um, sodium, uh, zirconium, so, zirconium, sodium, or cyclosilicate, right? Zirconium, <laughs> like, no, sodium. Sodium, zirconium. Like sodium zirconium <laughs> yeah it's the, it's that same thing you bought your girlfriend for her wedding ring um, <clears throat> now now ground up in an edible form uh, they these are uh, uh powders that you mix with uh water and you can drink they are very well tolerated by patients um way better tolerated than the sps which patients tend to hate and they're uh highly effective um and I've, I've had patients with uh, hyperkalemia. Uh, the, the one that I have personal experience with is Petiramir because it's been uh, available for a couple of years now. And it works great. I've used it in dialysis patients. I've used it in patients with advanced CKD or have not been able to manage their um, potassium. It has allowed me to continue to use uh, RAS inhibition, so ACEs and ARBs at high doses in patients with bad proteinuria. Uh, even though they were developing hyperkalemia, normally I would have to back off on that medication, which is real helpful for them. Uh, the Batyramir has allowed me to continue with the full dose of the ACE inhibition and um, and keep their potassium in a normal range. So I'm, I'm, I've been impressed with the efficacy of these drugs, and patients don't mind them at all, which is different than they get with the uh, with the uh, SPS. Cost-wise, is it is it available, uh, Paul's practicing in underserved? So I, you know, I think I think your uh, Medicaid is going to vary from state to state, but in Michigan, it's on the Medicaid list, and so it's available for those patients. The Petiramir, as of today, and I know they're trying to change this, it is only available at specialty pharmacies, and I think it has something to do with the um, the drug needs the it has some temperature restrictions, and it can't get too hot, or it becomes less stable. I'm not absolutely certain on the reasoning there, but. Uh, you're not going to be able to find it at your standard pharmacy, and that can make it difficult to get. Okay. Joel, so let's say uh, the final question here, let's say that you're sending someone home on a new loop diuretic. You're going to give them a potassium supplement, but you're worried about overshooting. Is that something that you see often? I, I don't know that I've I've really seen that super often, but we had a bunch of questions about it. Like, should I just automatically start someone with a loop diuretic on potassium supplementation? Right. So there was a, there was a study that looked at... Um, using loop diuretics and addition of potassium and using the loop diuretics with with potassium had a survival advantage of about uh, odds ratio of about uh, uh, 0 0.8 so there was a significant reduction in mortality if you give them uh, empiric potassium and so it seems like the reasonable thing to do i find that in my practice uh, I have a lot of patients on ACE inhibitors. I have a lot of patients with advanced CKD. And so I prescribe the loop diuretic and have patients follow up within a week or two to get a repeat potassium, magnesium, make sure that those are fine and only give the potassium supplement when, uh, when it's indicated. But uh, if you don't give it, so this is a, a subsequent study, a reanalysis of the all-hat trial. Remember, the all-hat trial is the largest hypertension trial ever done, 60,000 patients. Um, and one of the arms was chlorthalidone. And about 12% of patients had hypokalemia a year into the study. And if that potassium was not corrected, they had a 20% increase in mortality compared to patients whose potassium was corrected. And so I, you, you got to pay attention to these potassium levels. You can't let people uh, go go around. You fix their potassium, you fix their blood pressure, but you've left them with hypokalemia. You probably have erased a lot of the uh, survival advantage you've given them by lowering their blood pressure. And so make sure make sure you fix that potassium. Plus, potassium supplements alone have an antihypertensive effect. Right, so you can give potassium chloride, uh, especially in uh, in salt sensitive African Americans, and they'll they'll drop their blood pressure five seven points. Paul, did you have another question before? No, I really don't. I feel like we've covered a ton of ground. Yeah. 
I'm going to tell you what your question is. <laughs> your question is, I got a patient whose potassium is a little bit low. Can I just tell them to have a drink tomato juice? Can I just increase their oral uh, potassium intake to, to back that up? And I guess my answer would be the proof is going to be in the serum potassium. We have pretty good evidence that when patients are on diuretics, they're losing potassium chloride. And when you give them dietary advice, they're replacing it with potassium phosphate. They're not going to fix it. And it's much better to give them mineral potassium or potassium chloride, even though the pill sucks. It's way too big. Um, and uh, patients don't like taking it. Uh, one alternative is um, Morton's low salt or Morton's no salt is actually a potassium chloride granules. And uh, I've, I've had patients take that and they sprinkle it on their food. And it is a useful way of raising the potassium. Oh, love it. Practical tip. There you go. So, Joel, uh, first I'd like to ask if you had any major take-home points that you really wanted the audience to remember about hyperkalemia, and then I'll give you a chance to plug anything you wanted to plug before we end the show. Okay. So the, my pet peeve about the treatment of hyperkalemia is residents that say, yeah, the potassium was 6.2, so we gave them the cocktail. <laughs> and And I, I hear this all the time, and then – it just doesn't tell me anything. What is your cocktail? Does your cocktail include calcium chloride or calcium gluconate? Did you give them IV insulin? Did you check the, the glucose afterwards? To me, whenever they say they gave the cocktail, it's like they turned off their brain. They saw the serum potassium and they didn't think any further. And uh, what I would s suggest is every element of the hyperkalemic treatment need some thought before giving it, right? Make sure they don't have urinary obstruction because a Foley is a great way to correct hyperkalemia. Make sure they don't have hyperglycemia because if they have hyperglycemia, don't give the insulin and the D50. Give the insulin, monitor the, monitor the glucose and respond appropriately. If they, uh, if, you know, make sure you use, if you want rapid reduction of Potassium, albuterol is great. You're going to need to use an appropriate dose, which is going to be 10 to 20 milligrams. And one of the nice things about albuterol that we didn't talk about, patients that get albuterol get less hypoglycemia from uh, the insulin glucose combination. And then SPS is also oftentimes part of that cocktail, but I don't think it's appropriate in every case of hyperkalemia. Right, SPS is used. I reserve it only for patients that are annual, where I can't use uh, diuretics and saline to assist with the clearing of the serum potassium. I think those would be my take-home messages. Paul, I, I just—it's every episode with you, Joel, is a joy, and I can always tell when we've had an especially good episode when I just leave with more anxiety than I started with. And you realize <laughs> that that both the problem and the treatments confer higher mortality than I expected. Um, it's always nice to <laughs> just leave a little bit jittery. So I, I appreciate the little uh, intellectual goose that you you're give every just, single time. You're leaving like your patient has just received 20 milligrams of albuterol. Very jittery. <laughs> yep. That's exactly right. A little bit shaky, some palpitations, but I'll be okay. Joel, some final parting words to the audience. I know you have your big event of the year coming up in March, and I wanted to give you a chance to just kind of tease that. And we might have a... I don't know if you want to talk about this now or, or later, but we, the curbsiders might be doing some special things during that time. Well, I'll tell you the curbs, the, the, the event that you're talking about is Neff madness, which is a, uh, which is a, um, uh, a medical education event that spills over into social media. Uh, we're going to play, lay out uh, 32 different uh, nephrology concepts in eight different uh, academic regions uh, in a single elimination bracket not dissimilar to the uh, March Madness NCAA uh, basketball tournament. And uh, we're going to have these nephrology uh, concepts uh, face off against each other. Uh, and we're going to have uh, participants uh, predict which ones are going to win. Uh, last year, uh, the curbsiders had phenomenal participation. You guys generated a tremendous number of applicants or uh, uh, entries into Neff Madness. In fact, you guys, you guys won an award, right? You guys... Am I right about that? Yeah. Yeah, you are. Yeah. You are. I got my Neff Madness hat on here from the uh, <laughs> the swag from from winning that. Oh, we're gonna have great swag this year. <laughs> uh, actually, I better order that stuff. <laughs> <laughs>
so uh, and and what we're lo- we're looking forward to having the the curbsiders participate again this year, and we're looking forward to uh, doing some episodes with you guys uh, to go over uh, some of the different regions and uh, nephrology concepts. It should be a lot of fun. Yeah, we're looking forward to that a lot too. All right, Joel, as always, thank you so much for all your teaching tonight. And I'm sure some of this will carry on to social media. I'm sure people are going to have follow-up questions. There was there was a lot of them. We we got to most of them. I, I don't think we got to every single one, but there we got to a lot. This, is, this one was packed, so thank you. Hey, a lot of fun. Thank you. This has been another episode of the Curbsiders, bringing mm. you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy, thank you. Get show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. That's right. We're committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. Yes, you, Jim. Jim, please drop it. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. Special thanks goes to our social media team, Hannah R. Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garbs Garbatelli on Instagram, and Chris the Chew Man Chew on Facebook. Until then, I've been Dr. Stuart Kent Brigham. And I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. And goodbye. Good night. And goodbye. Right, we all know about giving IV insulin and glucose for hyperglycemia, but if they just have hyperglycemia, excuse me, we all know about giving insulin and glucose for hyperkalemia. <laughs> but <laughs> sorry, I heard, I heard that. I was like, "What's going on?" <laughs> the Twilight Zone. I was trying to pull. I was trying to move real quickly so you wouldn't notice how stupid I sounded. <laughs> a I permission to put that in the outro. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure if you've heard of this new treatment for hyperglycemia. (laughs) Just keep pushing sugar. It's fight sugar with sugar. It it makes sense.